Good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I've uh, known Brian and Pam for a while, and, and uh, Randy and Naomi, and just a great family. And uh, you're blessed to be in their congregation, and, and we're honored today that they would have us come and speak to you this morning. And our prayer is that we glorify Jesus this morning, and that he gets all the credit. And our message is real simple. Jesus changes lives. And that's the story, and I think that's the story that every church needs to be telling. And uh, some of them have maybe gotten away from that, but um, man, after that great time of worship this morning, I'm, I'm so refreshed, and, and Jesus was lifted up, and uh, it was a blessing to be there. We could all go home right now and be, and be good, uh, but we, we did come to speak and share our testimonies, and so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce kind of the program and tell a little bit about that, and then I'm going to have the guys come up and give their testimonies, and then I... I'll come up and, and close it at the end um, and tell you a little bit about my story. I want to read a scripture from um, Psalms 40. Um, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He's put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. That's a big word this morning, trust. And verse 4 starts out, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. So, um, John 3.16, it's a spiritual boot camp for men with drug and alcohol addictions. It's located in Charlotte, Arkansas, which is, uh, well, it's about two hours and 15 minutes from Popper Bluff. It's really kind of hard to get there from here if you've ever driven in North Arkansas. Um, but um, it, uh, it's about 11 years old, been in a ministry for about 11 years. And it's a, it's a long-term uh, program, six months to a year. Most of the men that come, come there and, and uh, stay a minimum of six months, and some of them can stay longer. Yeah. It's completely voluntary. A man has to want to go, um, and it's completely free. There's no charge. Their motto is, Jesus paid the price. And John 3.16 is the cure for drug and alcohol addiction. Um, I'm sure that all of you are aware of the um, drug and alcohol problem in um, today's society, in this region. Um, the need is great. Uh, for a place like John 316. Um, drug and alcohol addiction shows no um, economic boundaries. Um, it can affect anyone. And it says for every person that's affected uh, with a drug and alcohol addiction, there's 20 people who are affected by that in their family uh, and friends. And um, so most rehabs which I don't consider John 3.16 a rehab. Uh, I think that a lot of people will call it that. Um, most rehabs have about a 12% success rate. Um, John 3.16 has about an 85% success rate. So, amen. And that's because Jesus is taught there. Um, the, the key ingredient there is time, time to learn about Jesus, and time to do the things and implement the things in our life that he's asked us to do. Um, and I'll just be honest with you, I, it was the last place that I uh, wanted to end up. I don't think any man sets out in his young life and says, well, I hope to end up in a spiritual boot camp for men with drug and alcohol addictions. Um, the choices that we made along the way um, landed us there. Um, but I am extremely grateful that there was a place. I, I'd heard of John 3.16, I didn't know what it was. And in my mind, as I was in um, the thralls of drug addiction for many years, when I heard about it, I had pictured in my mind a, a, a little shack with a dirt floor and a bunch of guys with no teeth sitting around on the floor, you know, and a man with a clipboard walking around, you know. And that's where I was. I was, I was a long way away from... Um, but anyway... When, you, when I got there, because where I was in my drug addiction was completely hopeless. I had given up that I could be fixed. I thought there was something wrong with me. I had tried and tried and tried 
and tried to quit. It wasn't fun anymore. It was a prison. I was in a prison in my mind. I couldn't quit. I didn't have the ability to quit. And I was hopeless. I had even followed the Lord for a time and had given him my life and rededicated my life to him and, and had, you know, was good for about a year and a half and, and just, I strayed. I went, I went back and um, it had such a grip on me. And I was, I was married and I had three children and, um, and drug addiction ha- had me. I, I thought I had it, but it had me. And uh, I'm just, uh, it's by God's grace that I found out about John 3.16 and was able to go. A little bit about the program. Um, uh, for men 21 years and older, you have to want to get in to get in. It's completely voluntary. You have to go on a Sunday morning. In fact, one of our graduates um, couldn't be here this morning because he's taken a man down there this morning to try to get in. Um, there's four or five men from Popper Bluff uh, that are there right now. A couple of them getting ready to graduate and come back up and, and join us. Um, but uh, you have to want to be in. You have to want it. You know, if you know someone who struggles with drug addiction and you're praying for them and you want them to be better, it's not, it's not enough. They have to want it. And what happened to me is I cried out to Jesus at the altar Sunday morning, uh, December 30th, 2012. And I said, Lord, if you will put together this mess that I have made, if you will restore my marriage, if you will restore me as a father, if you will restore my mind. I'll serve you. And he did that for me. And um, that's our story, and that's what I want to share. And I'm going to have the guys come up and share, and then I'll, I'll come close it up. I did bring some brochures this morning on John 3.16, and all of us guys can assist you in, in uh, talking preliminary talks with a man and help them to get in down there. So um, I didn't bring a lot of brochures, but I do have a few if you want to see me after service. So first, I would like to introduce the first graduate to give their testimony this morning, and um, his name is Chris MacArthur. He's from Van Buren. And uh, Chris and his wife Lacey had come uh, by my house after I graduated, and uh, Chris um, was broken and, and uh, was asking for help, and uh, God's uh, helped him and done a wonderful work in his life, and I'd like you to give a nice applause for Chris McCarthy. Well, first of all, I'd like to say how awesome the praise and worship service is at this church. This is the second time that my wife and I have been here, and I mean, I had tears in my eyes, and my heart was beating fast, and it just, it's awesome. It's awesome. And I'm very very honored to, to be here and that you all would allow us to come and, and give our testimonies. And, you know, I, I was like Matt was. I, I was at the bottom. I was at the end of my rope. I had no idea how to make heads or tails of anything. I um, am originally from the Jeff City, Columbia, Missouri area. I grew up around there. Um, I started using drugs when I was about 17 years old and it was about that time that then I dedicated my life to drug use. I didn't just use occasionally or on the weekends. You know, that's, that's what my life was about. I was completely under control of the devil, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I had just completely handed my life over to him, and I was awful. I was not the kind of person that people wanted to be around, and that drove me, that drove me crazy because the, the, in, inside it was like I was at turmoil. You know, I wanted to be good. I, I wanted to be somebody that people liked and that people could count on and trust, but, you know, I, I didn't know how to get to that point because I had already surrendered to the devil. And, um, you know, it ended up, it, it, it cost me time and family and years of my life. I ended up going in and out of prison several times in my 20s and and early 30s. And for 18 years of my life, it was just awful. It was awful. There there was no joy. There was little moments here and there of of happy memories, but mostly it was just destruction and misery and pain. And, you know, I, I moved to Van Buren in 2009. I had gotten out. And I kind of wanted to start over. I knew that if I I went back to Columbia when I got out of prison that time, that it wasn't going to be a whole lot longer that I I was dead. It got to the point to where I was actually safer physically locked up in prison than I was running the streets. My life was just chaotic. There was starting to be guns involved in things that were going on. And, and, 
You know, my mother would lay awake at night when I wouldn't be home just waiting for that phone call when somebody would call her that I was back in jail or that I had been killed. And she, she told me years later that when she would get a call that I had been arrested, it actually, there was relief in that because she knew that I was somewhere where I couldn't do any more damage. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty hardcore thing for your mom to tell you and to have to deal with that. And it, that hurt me. And it made me think, you know, what, what is it that I'm doing? What, why, why am I living this way? And so in 2009, I decided to move to Van Buren, Missouri. And I was staying with my aunt. She was attending a little church. And I started going to church with her. And I heard my now wife, Lacey, sing one Sunday morning. And I thought, well, that, it would be nice to have a woman like that in my life that, that that was good, you know, that I could trust, that I could count on, and I thought, man, I, I just don't deserve that. I'll, I'll, I'll never have that because I'm such a piece of junk that, you know, I could, I could, never, I could never deserve that. And the more I went to that church, the more the people at that small church started showing me Christ, and, and they didn't judge me, and they didn't make me feel out of place. And looking back on it now, I realize it's because they love Jesus, and when you love Jesus, you love other people, and that's what being a Christian is all about. It's not about going to church on Sundays and Wednesday nights and not committing felonies. I thought that's what being a Christian was, but <laughs> turns out there's, there's quite a bit more to it than that. And so as time went on, I, you know, I started listening to what the, the pastor was saying at the church, and Lacey and I started talking a little bit, and we went out on our first date, and I thought... You know, I can, I can deal with this. I can live this life. But I had no idea what it truly meant yet. And so Lacey and I started dating, and I found myself in legal trouble again. And then here comes the preacher of the church that I'd been attending for a very short period of time, and he's, uh, was, that, was that in Kennet? Is that what jail? I don't, I've been to so many jails, I don't even remember how many I've been to, but anyway, I think I was in Kennett, Missouri. I'd gotten caught up down there, and here comes the pastor of the church in Van Buren, and I just remembered that I was finally, it, when they say you got to hit a rock bottom to change, that was my rock bottom. I, I, cr I was crying through the glass to him, and it was, it was tears of just desperation and frustration and confusion and loneliness and sadness. I, I knew that God was trying to give me something amazing and I didn't know how to handle it. And every time he'd try to hand it to me, I'd just throw it right back at him. And I was, I, I, I was sick of it. And I asked him why he was there. And he told me because he loved Jesus and that's what he was supposed to do. And I knew that he was real and I knew that I could trust him. So on August 11th of 2009, I prayed through the glass with my pastor and gave my life to Jesus, and he delivered me from cocaine and alcohol at that very moment. I knew that, that I would never do either one of those two drugs again. And I also knew that I was going to still have to face the music for the crimes that I'd committed, but as I walked back to my jail cell that day, I knew that I was free from that. And it wasn't just a few weeks later, I went to court, and they said, well, we're going to release you on your own recognizances, which basically means they're just going to, you know, trust that you're going to come back to court. Well, I was on probation in Columbia, Missouri, and my parole officer was actually in Van Buren, Missouri, and here now I'd caught new charges down in the boot heel in Missouri, and this wasn't the first time that I'd been in trouble. So for them to do that was completely against the way the legal system works. It had to be Jesus that, that let me out of that jail. And over the next several months, between going to court in Columbia and the Boot Hill and seeing my probation officer in Van Buren, Lacey and I ended up getting married and grew closer and closer. And I did have to go to, back to prison one more time, but I did a very, very small amount of time compared to what I normally would have had to do in that situation. And that was because I had given my life to the Lord. And when I, I came home in 2010, I got proud. You know, he had delivered me from something that I could not do myself. And over time, you know, he started giving me things. He, he gave us a nice home. He, he gave me a, a business. I was working for myself. I had a, a work truck, an old Jeep, and a boat. And I had all these things that I never thought I would have in life. And I walked out on my front porch one day, and I thought, boy, I'm doing a great job. And it just started going like this right after that because I'd taken the glory away from God. And, and started having pride in what I was doing. And 
A few years later, Lacey and I are on the verge of divorce. I had gotten hurt at work one day and discovered pain medicine. And really, I, I probably could have got by with some Advil, but I convinced the doctors that I needed something a little stronger. And I did that for two years, and it completely, I completely handed my life back over to the devil. And I thought because God had delivered me from cocaine and alcohol, that I was untouchable when it came to drugs and alcohol, and I wasn't. The devil snuck in the back door, and he found something else that he could get me with. And it was about that time that I went and talked to Matt, and he told me about John 316 in Charlotte, Arkansas. And I remember praying at the kitchen and telling God that I would do whatever it took, whatever I had to do, if he would just keep me out of prison, save my marriage, and take these pills away from me. And about... 30 seconds later, Lacey walked in the front door of the house and she said, hey, do you remember when we saw Matt last weekend? And I said, yeah. And she goes, let's go talk to him about John 3.16. And the first thought I had was, that place is six months. I'm not going anywhere for six months. Well, I just told God I would do anything. And there was my answer. It was, it was an immediate answered prayer. And, you know, going to that ministry was the best decision that I had ever made in my life. And it wasn't the ministry itself. It was the fact that Jesus uses that ministry to touch men like me that are hopeless, that think that there's, there's no way out. And he shows us that there is a way out. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says... Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, I'm not the person that goes out and commits felonies anymore. I'm not the person that lies to my wife about where my paychecks are going. I'm not the kind of person that my friends can't count on. You know, these guys sitting in this, these chairs back here, we're a family. We love each other. We're brothers in Christ. And the only reason that we're able to be here is because of Christ. It's not because of anything that we've done. We don't have the power to do anything. But because we have given our lives to Christ, he has given us the power to overcome the things that we could never overcome before. And now that I'm a new creation, you know, I have a responsibility to God to tell people what he's done for me and what he's done for my brothers and my family and my marriage. And... It's just, it, it's, it's so overwhelming and amazing when you think about things. The other day, Sean and I were on our way home from work, and it was Friday night, and we'd worked till dark, and there, we were talking about how there was a time in our lives when, you know, we wouldn't even have probably went to work on a Friday. And if we did and we got paid, our paycheck would have been spent before we got home that night. And the peace that comes from giving your life to God is just so overwhelming and I just love him so much and I love the opportunity to get up and say what he's doing and tell people that I serve a living God and like the God in the praise and worship team says all, sometimes all you need to say is just Jesus just Jesus all right well, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt thank you all very much for listening to me Actually, I'm going to give it to Jacob Ward. Let's give Jacob Ward a round. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, a little nervous. Uh, you know, uh, I go around, uh, you know, at the house, and I'm, I'm always worried about uh, what, what God wants me to do all the time. Uh, whether it's like, oh, I've got to pay these bills, and then uh, i got, you know, my son in there, and daddy, daddy, this, and, and you know, uh, I got to do all these things, and I always ask God, you know, what do you want me to do? And I got a lot, you know, I got a lot of stresses sometimes. You know, a lot of, a lot of things come in my life that, you know, uh, that I need to take care of. And I always ask God, you know, what do you, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, and I, I don't really know sometimes. And, uh, but right here, right now, I know exactly that this is where I'm supposed to be, that he wants me to tell you, you know, the good news of what he's done in my life. And, you know, and Jesus is great. God is awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I spent, uh, you know, I spent about four years in the Marine Corps, and, uh, you know, I did a tour in Afghanistan, and, er, you know, everything was, I had a good life, everything was great, and I, I loved the military, it was, it was one of the best achievements that I've ever done, but, uh, you know, when I came back from my deployment and stuff, you know, things weren't uh, as great as they were supposed to be, you know, uh, 
I got back and, you know, I had problems with my, my wife and uh, she got uh, hooked on some prescription medication. She just, it was just, you know, overdose after overdose. It just, everything just got wild and crazy. And uh, so, uh, you know, we got a divorce and all that and then we kind of split up our separate ways. And I took my son and me and him were just doing good. and. Uh, Got back here in Poplar Bluff for a while, you know, a couple of years. I tried school and everything like that, and uh, it, it it just got really hard for me. I started to uh, things back from uh, you know overseas kind of came back because I took my I was good. I had a a uniform. I had a hero suit. I was I was somebody, and then when you come back and you know you you take it off, uh, you right back down to the load uh, totem pole. Uh, you're it kind of feels like you're just nobody anymore, and I felt, uh, you know, I believed in God, but me and him is just like a, I felt sometimes, you know, God took days off, and, uh, you know, and, I, and honestly, you know, it, it, it wasn't him that was taking days off, it was me taking days off from God, and, uh, you know, I didn't have my hero suit on anymore, and I was just trying to do my life, and, and I was, uh, had my son, and, and I was, uh, having anxiety. I, I got uh, diagnosed with some anxiety disorders, whether it was PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and so I started getting medication and I started taking it slow and everything was good, you know, and then it started getting really bad uh, to the point where I was taking it more often within the couple of years. It, it, it just got uh, ridiculous. Uh, you know, I took care of my son. You know, I brushed his hair and I combed, I brushed his teeth and I took care of him. But then again, I lost all that inner emotion. I lost that love that, uh, that he needs. And uh, it got to the point where I was starting to drink a lot more. And uh, uh, it was just, uh, I don't know. I, ha I hated coming home with him. I grabbed him off the bus. He's there right now. And... I grabbed him off the bus, and then I would take him home, and then he would always say, Daddy, you know, and he would always tell me that he loved me. And, you know, it was just like sometimes when I look back at him that, you know, I smiled back, but it was fake. I didn't mean it, you know, and uh, it, it got that bad to the point where I didn't want my son to grow up with a father that didn't have any love or any kind of emotion. He would have seen a father who was going through so much pain and so much anger and hate. I mean, because your kids look up after you. You're the role model. They want to be just like who you are. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want him to live with me. And so I, I came to the point where I just didn't want life anymore. I didn't want to be nothing. You know, if I died the next day, I was okay with it. I wanted to be like that. I thought that without me, he would have a better life with either my mother or my brother, that he would have something better than me. And it, the pills and everything, it just got that bad. Uh, you know, I didn't love myself. I wasn't nobody. I wasn't something. Uh, but I started to go, John 3.16 came into, you know, the picture, and of course, I was like, I'm not going to do six months. It's like, boot camp? I was like, I already, already did boot camp. I already did military boot camp. I said, like, you think I'm going to go to a civilian and tell me what to do? That, that's, that's ridiculous. I, I really, you know, it was just, I had so much hate, so much pain. And I did, I, 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 I did go there, and I, I did the service, and... and Everybody, you know, was praising God, and everybody was so happy. Everybody was so happy, and I was just like, ugh. I was like, oh, my God, these guys are crazy. You know, honestly, that's how I felt. And I was like, ugh. Oh. I was like, that's disgusting. <laughs> I did. You know, and I was just like, I can't do this. There's no way. And, uh, you know, and I did. You know, I always, uh, you know, I went through the Marine Corps and, and I pushed harder. I was the smallest person in my platoon. I was an infantry. I was a grunt. And I pushed harder than everybody else, all the bigger guys, because I had to work twice as hard. And I did. And uh, so I did. I worked at it. I, I tried and tried. And it took me about a good couple of months. But then I accepted God into my life. I did. And it was. It was, it was the greatest feeling that I could that I could get the best high 
And when I asked him, I truly asked him to come into my heart, and he did. And he did. He really did. Uh, see, the, the Lord was, uh, I was patiently waiting on the Lord, but honestly, the Lord has been patiently waiting on me for so long. He waits for you, and he's by your side. And I've been, whether in Afghanistan or whatnot, he's by my side every time in all the pain and all that suffering. He's been there, and he saved me. He saved my life. He did. And uh, I did. I graduated from there, and I, and I tell you what, everything is, is so great. I got a house. I got my son, and he, you know, when he comes up and smiles at me and, and, and calls me daddy, I mean, that's great. That's God. That's, that's love. That's awesome. And sometimes I don't know what grace is, but when he comes up and says, Daddy, he loves me, that's God's grace. That's what God gives me. And whether I take all the traffic and the long line in the grocery store, and whether it's just a person coming by me just to smile at me, I feel so good. That's, that's God's grace. That's all that problems and all that negativity just goes away. But right now I'm striving to get God's grace all the time. Because sometimes I just get it for a little bit, and then all the negativity comes back. So I'm trying to get it all the time. And I want it all the time. But I gotta strive, I gotta strive, I gotta sacrifice something. And I always ask God, you know, I always plead it out to God. Why won't you save me? You know, please, you know, I'm, I always cried out to him all the time. And then I would go take another pill. Then I would go to the bar and uh, drink uh, 60, $180 worth of liquor. If you do not sacrifice something, God wants you to sacrifice. If he really wants you he wants to be in your life, but you have to want to be with him. And so you must, you must sacrifice something, and he will answer your cries. He will. He will answer. Because he did my, I, I gave it up. I sacrificed them pills and that liquor. I sacrificed, and then I went to John three sixteen, and I did it. And he came, he hurt me, and I felt it. And he's really there. God is great. God is awesome. And I got my mother here, and that's awesome. And uh, I just want to tell you that I love you so much. And she's actually in a, she's going to a, in a college. She's 60 years old and going to college. And, yeah. 60 years old and going to college. And she's got a math class with me. She just sits right by me. And, and, and I'm not embarrassed of you. And I love sitting by you in class. And I love you so much. And you're such a, 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 a tough individual. And... and, and Everything that what I've done and all, all, the, all the bad things has, uh, I don't regret doing none of the bad things because it's brought me today where I'm at right now. All the bad stuff, all that crazy stuff, which I don't really, whatever. But it's brought me to who I am right now. And it, 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 it's good. I love good. God loves me and I love God and everything is, uh, it's great. I strive every day to get it. And I just want you to know, Mom, that you know that I, I love you. I'm not embarrassed of you when you sit by me in class. And, uh, you know, everything that I did and all that bad stuff, it's not your fault. None of that is your fault. And you've done the best to raise us children, and you've done a great job, and there's nothing that you should regret about anything. Because I chose, you know, to serve the devil. But now... I serve God, and I, I <laughs> no. and not only do I don't have a hero, but you know what I have right now, which is awesome, I got the armor of God. I get to put on that, and then after I serve the military, I serve Jesus now. And whatever he wants me to do, and if he wants me to fight, I'll keep on fighting for him. Because this, every day I have a hero, so it's the armor of God. And I feel great. I'm worthy, I'm somebody. I'm special, you know, no one can take, God is forever for, my, is for me, and he is for you too as well, and no one can take God away from me unless I give him to you, so as long as you keep him in his life, he will, he will, he will continue to stay, he will always stay by your side, God is great, uh, I love y'all guys, thank y'all very much. Uh, I'm Justin, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, 22, and uh, I was sitting there, I was trying to pinpoint of, you know, what, what, what did I do wrong, or what did I, 
Like, where did it all start off? Or, you know, what was my first wrong decision in making? But I, right now, it doesn't even really matter because I, I needed all that to bring me through to where I am. And uh, I was thinking the other day, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed anything of that that happened to me. I, I guess, uh, you know, I was raised good, had good family, good parents, and went, you know, I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. I, uh, I go to church every Sunday, you know, I, I believe that Jesus came, but I've definitely learned now that it's a lot more than just going and sitting at church and just, you know, I, I lived a, a I guess a, a double life. Uh, most of my life, I was just this nice, handsome, uh, <laughs> polite, well-mannered young man around my family and my uh, parents and all that. But you know, then high school came and it was you know I had I got uh, I had a kid in high school and. Then that relationship kind of broke apart, so that kind of led me on down. And then, you know, I get just adapting to my surroundings and just running the road and fell into the wrong crowd, you know, game banging, drug dealing, criminal thug, as my mom would call me. But, uh, you know, that was, I knew deep down inside that wasn't me. I knew that I had a heart. But I was just callousing it all because I didn't like feeling any of them feelings. I didn't like caring or worrying about anything. So I just numbed all that with my with uh, prescription pills and alcohol and anything else really. But I, uh, in and out of jail, and I went to jail. I guess it's the last time I went to jail, and I got court ordered to a rehab. The judge. I guess the Lord was working in that courtroom. He knew I needed to be, you know, rehab and all of this. And I found John 3.16. And at first it was just a, you know, I'm going to do my time. Don't just sit on through it. But, uh, man, the Lord's working there. He worked on me tough, you know. Uh, I met a lot of good people there. I met a lot of good friends. I met the, I really met the Lord. I really grew a relationship with the Lord and am proud of my relationship with Him and strive to, you know, grow closer to Him every day. And uh, I guess I held on to a few things once I graduated and I came up here and I messed up a little bit. So I, I went back for a little while and now I know, I don't question that again neither, because I know that's the Lord need, know, knew I needed to do that. He knew I needed to, you know, put my all into him and to really surrender and sell out for uh, him. And now I'm, I'm blessed up here at Papa Bluff. I got all my guys up here. And uh, I worked work with Jimmy, and it's man, an awesome environment. You know, we get into the Word every morning, and, you know, it's just the Lord's really making a way for me, and I really am got grace and love and hope and uh, everything, man, that I can ever imagine, ever wanted. It feels good to actually be proud of myself and to have people proud of me. And, you know, I'm not going to go back because I don't feel like, I don't want that disappointment again. I don't want to feel that feeling of, man, I messed up. Got to make a phone call and tell this to this and that. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to feel that anymore. So I just want to give all the praise to the Lord. And uh, thank you all for letting me share. Morning. Uh, my name is Nick Higgins. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I'm a little nervous, I'm not going to lie, so this uh, that should probably help me keep it a little short. Uh, but um, I was uh, born in a Christian household. Um, 
I'm 35 years old. I'm 35 years old. When I was a small child, about seven or eight years old, uh, I got saved at a Christian uh, kids revival in our church. And uh, my parents, uh, really good godly family, kept us in church all the way through uh, high school. And I was real involved in church and uh, youth missions and uh, on fire for God. And uh, even went to a private school uh, from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, about 17 or 18 years old, um, I got it in my head somewhere along the way that I wanted to start doing things my way. And uh, I'd done it God's way for long enough, and I wanted to do some of the things that I saw going on around me. I wanted to smoke a little, I wanted to drink a little, I wanted to party, and, and uh, so that's what I started to do. And uh, in consequence, I just slowly faded out of church completely. And uh, between my um, graduation of my high school year, my senior year, uh, and starting college, I was smoking all the time, drinking all the time, every day. And then went away to college um, in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And basically that was just uh, my okay to party nonstop. Uh, and was introduced to crystal meth there. In fact, the, uh, the dorm room I was in, the guys next door to me were making it in their dorm room. And uh, so the, half the floor didn't even go to class most of the time. It was just drugs and partying and drinking. And so that's what I started to do. And I completed one semester up there and dropped out my second semester after experimenting with drugs and uh, smoking and drinking and went back to Little Rock. And instead of getting back to you know how I was raised and getting back in church, I decided to go into the restaurant industry and not even go back to school. And the restaurant industry was very accommodating to what I wanted to do because I could go out and party, I could go out and do, get any drug or do anything I wanted to do. And um, this was a pivotal point in my life because I remember my parents pulled me aside and my dad said, uh, you know, what is it going to take for you to turn your life back over to God? What is it that, that you're running from? What is it that, uh, you know, we can do to help you? And I, I told him, I was like, God is just not a priority in my life right now. And I, you know, I still can't believe I said that to this day. I said, he is just not important to me right now. And my dad said, well, you know, if that's true, then you're in for a world of hurt. And uh, he was right. And, uh, you know, I took that. I, you couldn't tell me how to do anything at that time. I was going to do it my way, and that's what I did. So I left there and started building up resentment towards them for the rest or the next several years of my life and just stayed away from them. Stayed in my restaurant crowd and uh, got a good job from them. I, I moved up the restaurant ranks from waiter, bartender to a, a general manager of a restaurant for many years. Um, met my wife there. Uh, we were together about five years and uh, had two children with her. But in the process of, um, you know, our marriage, we had our first child. And uh, I had started closing the restaurant all the time, so I started going back out with those people that I started drinking all the time and slowly faded out of my family life. And uh, I met a girl in a bar one night and we started talking and it was just a friendship thing for a while but before we knew it, it progressed farther than that and I cheated on my wife and while she was pregnant with our second child. And I uh, hid this for a while and she found out, we split up, I moved in with this other girl, thought I fell in love with her, that's what I thought. You know, I do think I was in love with her, but it had no chance to, to make it from the start with how it started, you know. And uh, we were together about two years, and I don't know if it was just the fact that I was constantly turning to the wrong thing at all times or the grief and shame building up inside me. I started experimenting with cocaine, and I hid this from her secretly for about a year and a half, and it just destroyed me. I spent everything I had on it. Uh, I lost my job as a manager, I lost my job as a waiter, I lost my job as a bartender, I lost everything over and over and over again. Then we split up and uh, I had nowhere to go. I moved back in with my parents, which was uh, crippling for me. You know, I was, uh, had been out of their house since I was 18 years old. I was 30, I think 30 years old at this time. And uh, I had found painkillers now too. And so I was doing cocaine and painkillers and anything, a garbage junkie is basically what I was. Anything I could get my hands on, that's what I did. And uh, about a year after splitting up with this girl, she passed away. We uh, were still real close friends, and somebody I thought I wanted to marry, but she died of an illness, and uh, that just kind of completely sent me off the deep end. And I stayed trapped there in my parents' house. I didn't even try and get a job. Um, and it was just the worst feeling 
just feeling like the biggest piece of junk you could possibly be. I couldn't even get off, off the couch. All I could do is motivate myself to go steal money from them and go buy drugs. And that's what I did. I used everybody I could just to, to feed my habit. My two kids, I was no part of their life whatsoever. Um, I loved when I was around them, but at the same time, I just didn't feel worthy to be their dad. I didn't feel worthy to be a good friend. I wasn't worthy to be a son, even, uh, to my parents. And uh, so in 2011, uh, my parents, through going uh, searching around online, found John 316. They told me about it, and uh, I agreed to go. And after three trips up there, and me finally getting serious about it, the third trip up there, because you know, I was just going for them at first, uh, they took me in. Uh, I graduated from there, and I can tell you, <laughs> for the first time since I was 18 years old, so I was 33 at the time, that is the only time I've ever had peace in my whole life, um, is rededicating my life to God there, um, giving me hope, um, and just feeling like you are somebody, being able to share, being able to, to, uh, to think that I would ever be up here talking to you uh, about what God has done and, and what God can do for you. If he can turn my life around, he can turn yours around. He can take you out of anything. And uh, so graduated from there, and uh, it's, it's funny how, how quickly we can get stupid again. Months later, I started trying to do it my way again. You know, I it got proud. And uh, so I relapsed, which is not an uncommon thing with, uh, in drug addiction. But I knew the cure, and I knew the solution, but yet I turned from it. But he never turned from me, but I turned from it. And uh, so my dad's prophetic words came about again. God wasn't a priority for me. And so I went through two more years of the pits. And I had just got a relationship back with my kids, lost it all again. And so they have a dad that's coming in and out of their life. And, uh, you know, it was just bad. So this time around, I lost it all. I've gotten a house, a truck, another good job. It lost it all. I ended up being out on the streets in Little Rock. And uh, went back to John 316, thank God. And uh, completed that program, and I've moved up here since. Uh, I've been up here for about four or five months, I think now, five months. And I'm uh, not planning on going anywhere for a while. I love it up here. Uh, I love the, uh, the God is moving up here. You can see it all around. We, we get to visit a lot of churches. Uh, he's a big part of the Crossroads program. And uh, I'm just so proud of my God, happy to be serving the living God, happy to be a part of this group down here. And um, thank you for letting us share. Appreciate it. Well, good morning. <clears throat> My name's Sean Usher. Um, I'm going to kind of give you the condensed version, but I started doing drugs when I was seven years old. <clears throat> I'm 36 now, so that's 29 years of drug addiction. It started out as marijuana. I think by the time I was 11 or 12, I was hanging out with older kids and skipping school and huffing gas and went from that into... Uh, just about anything I could do, I spent, out of the 29 years of addiction, I spent 16 to 20, I don't really remember anymore, but 16 to 20 of it in meth addiction. At one point, I missed out on a great job due to not passing a drug test for marijuana, so my, my big idea on that was I was going to quit that and start smoking K2, which is fake marijuana, and that got even worse, so... Then I spent the next five years spending over $100 a day on that habit, and that was just to survive, plus whatever extra I wanted to do. Um, when you're living like that, obviously your relationship's going to suffer because you don't have Christ in it. Um, I was married for 10 years, and about the time I thought my marriage was going to fall apart, my wife got pregnant, and that was... That was what was going to help. It was going to straighten me out, and I had something to focus on, so I thought. And uh, after my son was born, I tried to straighten up for a little while, but obviously we went back into, you know, it was, it was false. I still didn't have anything that was really driving me. Our, mine and my wife's relationship was still bad, regardless of having a child. And eventually I went right back into meth and um, this time it was a little worse you know because I didn't have anyone that I was honest with it about 
I didn't, my wife didn't know what was going on with it because, you know, the way I, the way that I made it okay to myself to lie to her about it was that I didn't want her to start doing it again as well because she, she had had the same problem. Well, she eventually did find out and asked me about it, and so I told her the truth, and that's whenever I decided I'd go get help at John 316. And uh, she was all for it until about the day before I went, and then she didn't want me to go anymore. And I thought it was because I'd be gone for six months, but I found out a while later. And I think it's because, you know, when you live that life, you both have secrets from each other. You both have lies. You both had these things and I went to the ministry and about a month in I thought I was doing good you know I still had too much of me involved in the middle of it I was trying to take control of these things obviously I had gotten over addiction you know that was good I didn't feel like I wanted to do drugs anymore I got away from it long enough that I just didn't even have the cravings but as I was praying every day that God's will be done you know I was a little skeptical because I thought, man, you know, I know enough, I'm smart enough to know that that could be detrimental. It might be something I didn't really want. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I had uh, been there for two months. I had gotten close enough with Christ that I really started wanting His will to be done. And I knew what that could possibly mean, but I had no idea what it really meant. And Chris and I had a conversation one day, and I said, you know, if we could decide, if we could think about everything important in our life, everything that meant the most to us, the things that um, the devil could attack us with the most, then we could simply prepare for that, and that would we'd be all right. Because then when he attacked us, oh, man, we would know. And as soon as I told him that, I had a fear in me because I thought, man, the only thing I have left anymore... I mean, even, you know, with my wife, I wasn't quite as concerned about that, but I thought, you know, the one thing I care the most about in this world is my son. That's, that would be the one thing that if something happened, it might would pull me away. And I guess it was less than a week later, I found out from my wife, she actually come up here and told me that my three-year-old son wasn't mine. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, that's a pretty crushing thing. I mean, that was, that was it. I had nothing left as far as I thought, you know. And for about two days, I was, I was lost. I didn't know, you know, I was hurting for her, for one, because, you know, obviously I didn't uphold my vows by the way I was living, and she didn't. I was concerned with her salvation as well. But it just really, you know, that's a 10-year relationship with somebody. That, that's pretty crushing. So anyway, about two days later, I think I went to bed that night, and I was pretty well in a fetal position in the bed, you know, and this is a 36-year-old man. And I really and truly cried out to God, you know. It was like I told him, I said, God, I cannot do this. You have to take over right now. I mean, I, I really felt hopeless and helpless, and, and you know, I really meant it. That's, I think that may be the first time when I prayed that I meant every word I said wholeheartedly. And I tell you what, I woke up the next morning, and uh, I was happy. I mean, I, was, I had more joy in me than I'd ever felt in my life. The only way I can describe it is the, uh, the joy of the Lord that you, you hear about. And when you experience it, there's no doubting it. And um, I almost felt guilty because I thought, man, I just found out this and, you know, all this stuff, and I'm just happy. And it was great, and, you know, it's a... Uh, Still to this day, I feel it, and, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed with the opportunity since I left the ministry and that I've started following what Christ would have me do, and I keep my eyes on Him that He's brought me up here with a wonderful group of guys that experience the same things, and I'm able to speak about His joy and what He can do in our lives because, you know, the uh, addictions doesn't just mean drugs and alcohol. Addiction can mean anything that has to do with relationships and work. I mean, everything can be an addiction. And, you know, it's, we don't only need Christ because we have addictions. We need Christ because we have sorrow. We need Him because we are just simply lost and in darkness. And I'm super blessed with the opportunity 
to have been through the things I went through and to come out following Christ, and he, and he just he directs my path. And um, I'm very willing at any point, because like I said, it's kind of the condensed version, but if anybody feels like they need to talk to someone, we're all available, and I'd be more than happy to go into, into detail if I needed to. But other than that, you know, it's all about God, and he just, he, he'll bring you through it and put you on top of it. Thank you. Okay, I don't know how normally, how long you guys go from, it feels like we've gone over, so I don't, um, Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit, and I just got to lift these guys up, they're, they're just doing what it takes, you know, and uh, God's blessed us here in Popper Bluff, we started our own 501c3 called the John 316 Graduate Program, we have some transition houses, we help the guys, um, uh, with place to live, we help them get, you know, if there's legal trouble, get through that. Uh, if they need a driver's license, a vehicle, you know, and uh, we try to get them in a Christian working environment. And uh, Jimmy Wagner down at Crossroads has got a couple of the guys that work for him, and it's been a real blessing uh, having uh, just ready work for guys when they come out of the ministry. We have two or three guys coming up in the next month, and just you guys keep us in your prayers. Um, the message, again, is simple this morning. Jesus Christ changes lives. And um, these guys, it's right here in front of you. It's the proof, you know. I battled addiction for 18 years and um, had reached a point in my life where I was so hopeless. And I had actually, um, just, just real briefly, but my wife had come home one night and, and found my drugs and she had taken off in the car and I, I knew the gig was up. This is after years and years of, of me lying and deceiving and um, I, I, I we got into a high-speed chase. I was going to get my drugs back, and I didn't care if I flipped her car and ran her off the road. We're coming down PP Highway, and it was just—it was later on that night. You know, fortunately, nothing—nothing nothing went wrong there. But later on that night, where I was in the fetal position, and I was crying out, and um, and he heard my cry. It's like it says right there in in Psalm 40. He inclined to me, and he heard my cry. And he will hear your cry today. And I just want to, um, as we close, I want the graduates to maybe come up and stand in front. Uh, Sean is going to play guitar, and Lacey's going to sing. And I want to ask Jimmy Wagner if he'd come up and just kind of maybe do an altar call. We just want to be up here to pray with you guys. Um, if any of you have a relative that's suffering with addiction, or if you yourself, you know, I sat in church every week, and I was, I was high. And so... Um, if you just have a need, it doesn't even have to be drug or alcohol related, but just come forward and we'd like to pray with you. And again, thank you for the opportunity to come up here and, and share with you. Thanks, Brian and Pam, for, for having us. It's been a, a real blessing for us. I don't know why I got this on my mind, but it's good to talk about the, the thug life. <laughs> a true hero under God. That's what you guys are you now. That's what God does, takes you from, from that life and, and turns it around for your good, you know. So it's a true hero for, for Jesus, man. So I want to I wanna encourage you, you all to come up and pray with these guys. As Jesus uses this ministry, the devil wants to shut it down. The devil, the devil attacks these guys all the time, always trying to lead them into, into uh, temptation to steer them the wrong direction and they need your prayers uh, they need your help they need to stay focused on Jesus every day just like the rest of us um, just I want to read I want to read something out of the word real quick and this came up in, in Sunday school this morning and Andy nudged me and said that's your favorite verse I said, yes it is it's a good one and then Chris MacArthur read it again and listen you don't have to wait to praise and worship God when the praise team's up here. You know, you don't. You don't have to wait to, to give a shout out or say Jesus's name just when just when we're having praise and worship on at church. You know, we, we can we can just read the word and say Jesus or say or just let out a woo, you know, or an amen. We should we ought to get excited about this word because this this is what. This is where your faith came from when you heard this. You came to faith in Jesus Christ. This is, <laughs> this is everything right here in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5, verse 17. And as I read this, 
When I heard it read this morning, me and Andy were sitting there, and it's hard for me to sit still and not, and not, and not let out an amen or, a, or thank you, Jesus, or something. So as I read this, man, don't hold it in. Let out that praise and worship. If, if I read something that inspires you, let, let out a shout. Say that name of Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> but listen to this. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Amen. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <laughs> As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. Come up, me and the women of God. Lay hands on these men. Pray for them to have strength and for them to stay focused on Jesus. For the, for the Spirit to keep leading and guiding them. Also, if you if you know someone in your life, your, your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your niece or nephew that's, that's struggling with drug and alcohol addiction, come forward, let these men pray for you and pray for, pray for your loved one. You do not have because you do not ask. You just pray that God will... God will send them someone. God will send them a man like Matt Bedell to cross their path. That, that they can find the cure, whether it's at John 3.16 or through Grace Christian Fellowship or Crossroads. You know, Jesus, Jesus is all around. We just need them to come to Jesus.